Hi Facebook, I am your friend Vanessa. Uh, some of you may not recognize me because my profile picture is so much cuter and photoshopped. Um, but this is me, unfiltered, and um, I am doing this v video as a first of what I'm hoping to become many. And I'm doing it uh, unscripted, unedited, and uh, so I invite your feedback and your critique. My only guideline really is to keep it kind and constructive. Uh, in this first video, I thought that I would share a little bit about my trip. Uh, recently was in the high desert of New Mexico. I went with a good friend of mine who um, I would call a life partner. Uh, she and I have known each other for about 18 years and as an only child, she is really uh, what resembles most a sister to me. So uh, we were in Santa Fe, which is really a mecca of arts and culture. It's home to international and national museums of history and art. And one of the highlights of our trip there was to visit a place called Meow Wolf. It's uh, 7,000 square feet of art installation. And so for some of you who maybe don't really know what an art installation is, um, art is often experienced as you know, something uh, on the wall or maybe a sculpture in a room, uh, often sort of a one-way communication uh, from artist to viewer. Um, but an art installation occupies the entire space and it creates an environment for the participant to step into. It creates an experience and often an alter reality that uh, you know, exposes something about our human condition, something about our reality that we live in. And so, Meow Wolf, uh, we were standing on the lawn of a nice house. This is all inside of a building. And we went into the house, and it's designed to look like a nice home. There were people inside doing very regular, everyday kind of activities. There was uh, somebody sitting there watching the television, uh, other people on the sofa flipping through their phones. We went upstairs, and there was a man flipping through a book, and his son was on the computer. And if you had the time to do that... Um, there was a narrative that the artists uh, were, you know, creating that um, you could, you know, watch the TV and listen to the radio and, and look on the computer. And uh, we were on a little bit of a timeline, so we went through the fireplace. <laughs> and there were these portals in this house that took you into these more imaginal spaces. Uh, you could go through the fireplace, or you could go through the fridge, or you could uh, go through the closet door. And we went through the fireplace, and we found ourselves inside the ribcage of a brontosaurus. And there was a woman in there uh, with mallets playing the ribs, and they were musical. And this is all quite high-tech. It was all very well done. And uh, so we... Uh, went into another area that it was a big cave and there were stalactites and if you hug them they emanate a tone and so there's all of these stalactites and people hugging them and it was creating this really beautiful music um, and as the people shifted in the space the sound shifted as well it was really really quite beautiful um, Another area that we were in was the uh, uh, spaceship. It was all very um, sterile, like you would imagine a spaceship environment to be. And then we ended up at the end of this hallway in the spaceship, and it was like the inside of a fridge door, you know, holding the condiments and everything. And as we were pondering this, um, space, this new space we found ourselves in, a man from inside of the house opened the fridge door and looks inside as though he's looking for snacks. <laughs> and he sees us standing in a, in um, this spaceship. And so what's really kind of fantastic about that is that it put 
you in the shoes of the other. You know, it was um, designed to create an experience where you couldn't help but see from the other person's perspective. And, you know, that's done through the absurdity of the environment. So, um, you know, this guy had a look of surprise on his face. And you can't help but see that he's seeing you inside of this you know, spaceship. <laughs> and uh, so you become part of this installation experience. And it's really, really fantastic. Another... Uh, area of experience there to share with you is um, we were in this room with a big grand piano and uh, I was playing a song I don't know how to play the piano but I was you know creating a rhythm and I was playing a song uh, something that resembled music anyway my friend was dancing and this other person came along and joined her in dancing and after my performance and decided, you know, that we would maybe move on to the next space, uh, this girl said, no, please, like, keep playing. Uh, it's only just begun. So I played another song and they kept dancing. And what's really kind of interesting about that is that, you know, we would see her around later in other areas. And it was like meeting an old friend. It was like, um, you know, that... Uh, sort of distance that you keep with strangers typically in the social space was uh, not there because we had this experience, this wonderful, beautiful experience of uh, music and dance together. And so it was like a meeting of an old friend whenever we would see her and you know, we would ask her, oh, where have you been and what did you see? <laughs> um, and really all of this is to say that, you know, this, this designed experience or this designed space uh, had a great effect on our interactions with each other and um, and also the internal world that we were occupying. Um, so, you know, this is something that I think is really important to talk about in this going forward uh, as we are always, you know, designing our social spaces. Um, how can we design our space to help change our conversations and how we interact with one another? Um, you know, that thin veneer of civility that we use in public uh, to interact with strangers uh, often really prevents real conversation from happening. And if you read the comment threads of any article, you'll see, you know, that uh, often there are comments in there that are uh, expressing a lot of fear and concern. And my concern is that these go unaddressed. Um, and the danger in that is that they eventually become expressed in very unhealthy ways. So sort of as a prevention of that from happening, um, you know, we need to consider how can we create space to allow for these conversations to happen and um, engage people in their fears and and their you know their uh, concerns without them becoming um, you know like something that festers and becomes an unhealthy expression of violence. Uh, in society so um, I've been thinking about sharing this now for some time and it seems like today is a really good day to do it because uh, I woke up to the bad news of there being another mass shooting in uh, Florida and this is really horrific um, we're just not designed to take in the the bad news of seven billion people uh, constantly. Um, for some perspective, I guess my question would be: Why are we not talking about, you know, the extremists and the violence that's occurring within, say, Judaism or Christianity, or you know, really any ideology out there? There's there are extremisms everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I guess uh, 
The other thing I would offer is to keep in perspective that um, these events are not representative of anything, really. They're representative of one crazy guy. Um, they're representative of uh, conversations that go undone, you know, conversations that don't get to be had. Um, because um, there are 7 billion people, and there are not 7 billion people going around committing acts of horrific violence and hate. So uh, let's remember that in, in these uh, confusing and difficult times, that the majority of us are good. And so I'm going to leave it there for right now and um, go and enjoy the rest of what I have left of this Sunday. It's turned into a nice blue sky day and I'm kind of excited to see if any of my flowers are blooming. <laughs> so uh, enjoy the rest of your day and I um, send you blessings and hope that you have peace in your heart.